ಶ್ರೀಯುತೀಗುರುಣಾ ಸಹ ಗಣ ರಘುನಾಥ ತಂ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಧ್ವೈತ ಸಾವಧೂತ ಪರಿಜನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಹ ಗಣ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ವಿಶಾಖಾ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಕರುಣಾ ಸಿಂಧು ದೀನಬಂಧು ಜಗತ್ಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾಕಾಂತ ರಾಧಾಕಾಂತ ನಮೋಸ್ತುತೆ ತಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಾಂಗಿ ರಾಧೆ ವೃಂದಾವನೇಶ್ವರಿ ವೃಷಭಾನುಶ್ರುತೆ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯ ವಂಚಕಲ್ಪತರೂಭ್ಯಶ್ಚ ಕೃಪಾಸಿಂಧೂವೇವ ಪತಿ ಪಾವನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸಾದಿ ಗೌರವಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮೋ ಹರೇ ರಾಮೋ ರಾಮ ರಾಮೋ ಹರೇ 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 ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಆಲ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಜರ್ನಿ ಆಫ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕವರಿ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಆನ್ ಡೇ ಫೋರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಕೋರ್ಸ್ ಐಮ್ ಶ್ಯೂರ್ ದಟ್ all of you all who have been part of this journey have been uh, i'm very very sure that this course has really touched your heart in some way or the other um of course we're still halfway <laughs> the course is not yet over it's far from being over but uh, already you must have seen that there has been a lot of research a lot of very in depth study and a lot of very practical um structures to the course so it, it makes it very very easy to digest easy to understand and uh, eventually you'll see it it'll be easy to apply also so for uh, before we begin uh, i would like to you know for all those of you all who who can keep your cameras on keep do keep the cameras on throughout the session it will be very helpful for me as a teacher to see you all uh, while i'm speaking it's always a pleasure to see the students that are hearing uh, of course for those who have practical issues like internet and uh, so many other things that's fine um uh, yeah so today we're going to be, uh, be doing a very very important subject which is one god or many gods before i get into that this is one of the most complicated subjects you know of the entire course is one of the most complicated subjects not only of the entire course is the most complicated subjects in the entire uh, uh concept of religion itself you know i don't think this is the, uh, this subject has been ever uh properly addressed and clearly uh very logically explained uh this far so i am trying my best to help you all understand the subject which is so complicated in a very simple and easy to understand manner just like i have done for the first three sessions so quickly summarizing everything i spoke so far we began by the course by talking about the search for happiness and here we spoke about the commonalities between humans and animals the seed which is the sleeping eating enjoying defending the common things and the differences are a b c d ability for uh, i inquiries b is bliss c is choices and d is determination to follow the a b and c and we saw that we can experience real happiness if we solve the real problems of life and we list to the real problems as birth old age disease death are the are the atmic klesh miseries caused by the body and the mind are the bhautik klesh miseries caused by other living entities and are the daivik klesh miseries caused by natural disturbances and then we spoke about how the world is offering us three temporary solutions which are superficial uh, sorry which are first a scientific advancement sense gratification second is speculation and third is superficial religious rituals 
and then we spoke about we are trying to find the right thing which is happiness but in the wrong place which is this material world which is called as dukha lai which means a place of misery and we saw the solution was the permanent solution was connect back to god who is our father and by connecting back to our father we experience real happiness and then on day 2 we spoke about these uh, the does god exist and first we began by speaking about the proof for the existence of god we spoke about uh, four things essentially uh, creator implies a creator laws imply a law maker uh, organization and order and uh, finally we spoke about how design implies an intelligent designer and then we spoke about the two definitions of god spec s p e c which stands for supreme Pro um, uh, source supreme proprietor supreme controller and supreme en uh, enjoyer s p e c and we spoke about the second uh, definition of god which is bhagavan bhagava the word bhagavan means bhaga the word bhaga means opulences and bhagavan means the one who possesses six opulences in completeness we spoke about six opulences which are aishwarya wealth we spoke about uh, knowledge uh, beauty strength uh, fame and renunciation six things if somebody has in completeness that person is bhagavan and um, these two definitions we will actually apply it today you know in our discussion on who god is and then we spoke about the uh, uh, the idea of cause and effect we saw that we may not be able to see god but we can see the effect that he produces in this world and by seeing the effect we understand there is a cause and then we spoke about the three methods of gaining knowledge about god pratyaksha praman anuman praman and shabda praman pratyaksha praman means gaining knowledge through sense perception we saw that senses have four defects we have imperfect senses we have a tendency to be illusioned we have a tendency to commit mistakes and fourth we have a cheating propensity because of which pratyaksha praman is not a great way of gaining knowledge about god and then we spoke about the second which is anuman praman the word anuman means guess work the whole idea of guess work itself is a very very bad uh, way of gaining knowledge about anything in this world what to speak of talking about uh, getting knowledge about god so anuman praman also is not a great idea and then the third thing we spoke about is shabda praman which is the word of authority we spoke about shabda the word of authority the written word of authority have a, has a lot of power and that power is what gives weight to the authority and then we spoke about some proofs for why we can have faith in the scriptures we spoke about historical information that have been proved to be true we spoke about scriptures being instruction manuals and then we spoke about uh, many predictions in the scriptures that have come to be true eventually and then the last time we spoke about the third session which is who am i we spoke about our identity being the fact that we are not the physical body but we are spirit soul and then we spoke about uh, some proofs how we are how we can understand that we are the spirit soul so in logic we saw common sense we say uh, the person who is dead is there but you know we say he passed away who passed away we spoke about introspection we say this is my watch that means the watch and me are two different things so this is my body the body and me are two different things then we spoke about the idea of cause and effect we can't see the soul but we can see the effect that the soul cause produces and then we saw science uh, two things near death experiences so many people who have had near death experiences of seeing themselves from outside and we also saw about past life memories people that remember their previous lives and then we saw from the scriptural point of view what the scriptures okay, have um then we um, saw the next topic which is seeing the soul if if i want to see something i need to follow a process if you want to see the soul there is you can see the soul provided you are ready to follow a process and if you are not ready to follow the process you will not be able to see the soul even if you want to you demand for it and then finally we spoke about uh, how all of us have uh, three types of bodies there's a gross body which is made up of earth water fire air ether inside that we have a subtle body which is made up of the mind intelligence and the false ego and within that we have a third body which is the spiritual body which is the real us satchit ananda eternal full of knowledge and full of bliss and then we saw so many qualities of the soul 
So this gives us a small background of all the sessions that we have done so far. Now we're going to go and get into this uh, today's session. Before I even start speaking to, to, about today's session, let me uh, give you all some very important things that you should keep in your mind while you're hearing today's session. The first thing is keep your mind open. Keep your mind completely open and ready to receive knowledge in the right spirit. Second, whatever you know about God till today and whatever understanding you have of God till today, just keep it a little aside for the time being, just for, for the time being, you know, so that you can absorb what I'm going to tell in the right spirit and try to understand everything I'm going to say in a very logical and a very, very systematic manner. And most importantly, at the end of today's discussion, please ask questions. Even those who have not asked any question till now, I request you all, please ask questions because today, after today's session, you will have a lot of questions. You may not ask it, but it will stay in your mind. And the more it stays in your mind, the more dangerous it is for you. So even if it is a very silly question at the end of today's session, please do ask. And I don't mind if the session goes up to 930 also, I will stay. I have no, I'm not in any hurry to end the session uh, unless and until I answer all your questions. Okay. So having given that background, let me start today's session. India is a market house of gods. Every single day, newer and newer gods are being born. You know, uh, in Bangalore once there was an interview of 30 Kalki avatars in the, I mean, at one given point of time, 30 people were saying I'm Kalki avatar. So one uh, TV show host, he called all these 30 people together. The other fellows didn't know that, you know, the others also being called. So everybody thought exclusive interview of Kalki, Kalki Avatar. So when all 30 were assembled together, the TV host show that fellow said, so all of you all claim to be Kalki Avatar. So please decide among yourself who is real Kalki. And he walked away and people had like a ball of a time seeing these 30 Kalki Avatars interact with each other and try to prove that I am a real Kalki Avatar. In America, there was a point in, you might think that if this happens only in India, no, it happens everywhere. You know, in America, there was a point in time where 350 people claimed themselves to be Jesus Christ resurrected. All of them are either sent to jail or sent to mental asylum. But in India, they all get platforms, you know, and they all get worshipped and they all get their followers also. See, God is not a person who just produces tricks. If you want to see tricks, go to a magician. The magician probably will show you better tricks. Why do you need God? You, what you're looking for is a magician. Go to a magician. You will, he will show you good tricks. God is not a person who just cures diseases. If you want someone to cure your diseases, go to a doctor. The doctor's profession is to cure diseases. Why do you need God? To understand the idea of God, we need to um, refer to the word of authority, which is the scriptures. So a lot of people don't really have that much faith in the scriptures and they keep challenging. You know, I remember one time I was hearing Srila Prabhupada, who was the founder of the Hare Krishna movement. Srila Prabhupada was elderly man, very, very uh, scholarly one. Uh, Reporter asked Srila Prabhupada, he said, he's a very challenging spirit. He said, what if at the end of your life, you realize that God doesn't exist? What will you do? This reporter asked, you know, Prabhupada like this. And Prabhupada gave a very interesting answer. He said, if God doesn't exist, if I realize at the end of my life that God doesn't exist, no problem. I've lived a good life. I've lived a life of good character. I have... Uh, saved money you know, without unnecessary expenses, uh, experienced peace and tranquility in my life, uh, you know, met a lot of good people. And uh, I lived uh, all my life with a sharp memory, sharp intellect, eaten the best quality food, you know, done the best uh, things in the world, had good fun. Prabhupada then continued. He said, what if at the end of your life, you realize that God exists? What will you do? And that man, 
he's you know he really started thinking you know so propa told him if at the end of my life i realize god doesn't exist i have no problem because i still lived a good life but if god really exists and you realize at the end of your life and you have been doing all nonsense what will you do so to help us understand this whole thing of so many gods let me give you a simple example for you to consider all of us see the sun every day in the morning isn't it especially if you get up in the morning you know uh so when you see the sunrise when you see the sun shining beautifully now you might call it by different names somebody might call it ravi somebody might call it suraj somebody might call the sun dinkar somebody might call the sun as solates somebody might call the sun bhaskar somebody might call it the sun itself somebody might call it as jayo somebody might call it as solel somebody might call it as yang wang different people call the same sun somebody might call it as son the same sun is known by so many names now if i call the sun as suraj and you call the sun as solel am i talking about something different i'm talking about the same person but with different ways of calling the same person one person can have many names in india every single person has multiple names isn't it you know you called at home by one name you called it in office by one name you, you know you called uh, so many your friends call you by a different name so here that one god that we know has so many names according to the quality that is being emphasized like say for example the word yehova uh it it means the one who is all powerful it is referring to that aspect of god which is all powerful aspect of god if somebody calls god the same god as allah for example you know the word allah means all merciful it is referring to that aspect of god which is merciful somebody may call god as krishna Uh, that the word krishna means all attractive somebody may call ram as ram god as ram ram means the one who gives pleasure to others so every name of of god actually is referring to a different aspect of god god has so many aspects depending on which aspect i am focusing on there is a particular name that i am focusing on it doesn't mean that the other aspects are wrong or the other aspects are limited every aspect of god every way of looking at god is so different and it's perfectly fine if different people look at god in different ways um if god is one you know this is something that many many people want to know if there is only one god in this world why are there so many scriptures why are there so many religions this is something that everybody wants to really understand um different religions have come up at different phases in, in life right like for example sikhism is about 600 years old islam is about 1300 years old christianity is about 2000 years old uh, buddhism is about 2500 years old bhagavad gita was spoken by krishna and arjuna about 5000 years ago so now each religion claims that they have perfect knowledge about god and all others go to hell now just from a common sense point of view you ask a christian before 2000 years before jesus christ did people go back to uh, hell if did did everyone who die go to hell or did anybody go to god Before Jesus Christ, what happened to all those people who were born before two thousand years? You think there's no path for them at all? You think they have no way to reach God at all? They had no hope at all, and only after Jesus Christ was born, suddenly hope got born. How can it be true? The idea of multiple religions, the idea of having so many religions, is a very simple idea. To help us understand this idea, let me give you an example. just like if you have gone to school and uh, studied mathematics i'm sure you would have gone through various levels of mathematics 
like if you are in an elementary school you are taught numbers you are taught addition subtraction very basic level of maths you go to high school then you learn a little bit of algebra a little bit of trigonometry you know a little bit a higher level of understanding of uh, of uh, um, knowledge of the of, of the subject you go to college engineering mathematics is much more complicated triple integration and so many complicated subjects you know matrices diagonal matrices so complicated subjects of mathematics and you go to a, do a phd on math in mathematics i mean how complicated is that so imagine if you're te teaching a phd mathematics subject to a kid in the kindergarten how will your kid even understand what you're talking about so you have to teach maths not according to the level of the intelligence of the professor it is according to the level of intelligence of the student isn't it jesus christ while he was teaching you know um when he, when he was sharing his knowledge with with people now interestingly if you observe the way jesus christ taught the message that every religion teaches is exactly the same very simple message love thy god with all thy heart and all thy soul the word islam means surrender um bhagavad gita is talking about sarva dharman parityajya maam ekam sharanam braja abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me christianity talks about you know um uh, chant glorification of the holy names uh uh father in heaven uh, hallowed be thy name christianity speaks about it all the time chanting the holy names uh in uh, islam we have 99 names of allah that uh, they chant and uh, the same idea of chanting the holy names in the in the vedic scriptures also the same message obey god sin no more return to the kingdom of god all religions is, are essentially speaking the same message whether it is christianity you study the holy bible whether you like you look at look at uh, jesus christ while he was speaking he was sharing the knowledge with so many people and look at one of the statements that jesus christ speaks about he said o men of less faith i have a lot to tell you but you cannot take it now what does it mean it means that he has a lot to offer it's not that his knowledge is limited but he is a great teacher and being a great teacher he knows how much to give if the teacher has a lot of knowledge and i want to download all my knowledge on the, on my on my students but if the student is not kept, not having the capacity to handle it the teacher should know i can, i cannot just download like that you know unlimited knowledge and for whatever knowledge jesus christ taught them look at what they did to him his very people the very people that he taught to crucified him literally prophet muhammad if you study his life the prophet muhammad had so much to share to the world and when he shared the knowledge he had to share knowledge to the extent that the students or the people that were coming to him could handle jesus christ when he was preaching he was preaching to whom basically the fisherman community and prophet muhammad he was preaching to whom nomads in deserts and look at the extent if this has to be there in a holy scripture thou shall not have a relationship with a mother or a sister if somebody has to write this in a holy scripture imagine the level of the person that you are teaching to i mean this is not something that you have to even tell people isn't it if somebody is a human being if somebody has some kind of a basic culture a cultural upbringing you don't have to tell this but for whatever prophet muhammad shared with them what did they do to him two times he had to run to save his own life twice he had to run away to save his own life and that's the kind of that's the level of people that he was preaching to and arjun whom krishna taught the bhagavad gita to what a what a level of, level of person he was there is a very beautiful verse in the bhagavad gita where krishna tells arjun whatever i wanted to share with you i have shared with you in this in this book in this scripture so he say so he speaks about how everything is 
encompassed in uh, the teachings of the Gita. And he has nothing more to share. He shared everything that he needed to share. So now look at the level of audience that Arjun is. And just to give you a simple example of the caliber of Arjun, you know, Arjun was once went to the heavens. And while he went to the heavens, there was a very beautiful uh, uh, heavenly damsel named Urvashi. And Arjun was, you know, looking at her dance and uh, his father Indra thought he's interested in her. And Indra sent Urvashi to Arjun to meet him later. And Urvashi came and proposed to Arjun saying, you're a handsome man, I'm a beautiful girl, let's unite. Arjun said, no, I'm not looking at you like that. He said, when I saw you, I thought, I mean, I was thinking, you are the wife of one of my ancestors, great, 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 great grandfather, you know. And I, I can't see you in any other way other than my great, 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 great grandmother. You know? I mean, look at the level of Arjun, that here is an Apsara who is offering herself to him and he's saying no. That is a level of uh, person that Arjun was. Very knowledgeable, very charismatic, very powerful and very, very skilled. And Krishna is telling him, I've given you complete knowledge. So the Bhagavad Gita is claiming to be complete knowledge. Whereas if you look at the way Christianity and Islam uh, and the teachers, they're teaching knowledge according to the level at which the audience is. Bhagavad Gita is taught to a level of an audience which is much, much superior. The word Hindu, which is what we all identify with, isn't it? The word Hindu itself is a misnomer. The word Hindu doesn't exist in any of our scriptures. If you look at all the scriptures, all the Vedic scriptures, you will not find the word Hindu anywhere. So where did the word Hindu come from in the first place? It's very interesting if you look at history, when uh, um, the, the Mughals attacked, you know, when they were entering into India, you know, uh, there was a particular river known as the Sindhu River. And they had to cross the Sindhu River to reach. So while they were on this side of the Sindhu River and they were going to cross the Sindhu River, so they couldn't speak the word Sir properly. So instead of saying Sindhu, they used the word Hindu for the Sindhu River. And that is how anybody who stayed on this side of the Sindhu River came to be known as Sindhus. But actually it came to be eventually known as Hindus. So the whole tract of land on this side of the Sindhu River is known as Hindustan. So Hindustan is not a religion. Hindustan is not about Hindus. The word Hindu itself doesn't exist in, in, our, in our scriptures. The word that is used for the religion that we represent is known as Sanatan Dharma. The word Sanatan Dharma is the original word for Hinduism, basically. And what is the word Sanatan Dharma? It's a very interesting word, you know. Dharma means you can loosely translate it as religion. But actually the word Dharma doesn't translate as religion. Dharma, the word Dharma cannot be translated in English. You know, there are some Sanskrit non-translatables. There are some words that you cannot translate from Sanskrit to English. And this is one of them. The word Dharma is so much more than religion, so much broader, deeper, wider, and heavier than the word religion. The word Dharma from a, from at least a close perspective, it means constitutional position. What is the meaning of constitutional position? I'm going to talk about it when we speak on uh, day six. But in a sense, the word constitutional position means what is the innate quality of that object? The innate quality of sugar is to be sweet. You cannot have sugar that is not sweet. If you say, if you say this is sweetless sugar, does it make any sense at all? You know? Or the, the innate quality of salt is to be salty. Can you have salt that doesn't taste salty? Doesn't make any sense. So the innate quality of a substance is called dharma of that substance. So what is the dharma of us? The atma, the spirit soul. What is the dharma? And that's what religion is. 
And the word Sanatana is a very interesting word again. Sanatana means eternal. Eternal. So what is Sanatana Dharma? Sanatana Dharma is the eternal religion of the soul. We use the word religion now, you know. So it is the eternal duty or constitutional position of the soul. Now, if you look at it from this point of view, is it a religion? This is considered to be the religion of the soul. The soul is not a Hindu. The soul is not a Christian. The soul is not a Muslim. The soul is not even an Indian or a Pakistani or a American or the soul is eternal. And what is that eternal religion or eternal duty of the soul? That's what is called Sanatana Dharma. Now the question is, when did Sanatana Dharma begin? You have a date for Christianity. You have a date for Islam. You have a date for Buddhism. You have a date for Sikhism. Do you have a date for Sanatana Dharma? There is no date. Why is Sanatana? Sanatana means eternal. It's been going on from time immemorial. There's no, there's no time when it really uh, you know, stops. The idea <coughs> is all these different religions that have come up. They have come up according to time, place and circumstance. So that great teachers, whether it's Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, you know, um, and many of the Guru Nanak Ji, many of the great teachers, they have taught according to the ability of, uh, of the audience to understand. They have taught to, so that the audience advances step by step from wherever they are, a little bit they, they need to progress. That is how the knowledge was given. So the knowledge was given with the understanding of where a person is. If a person is already at PhD level, you can't give him knowledge of kindergarten. I need to give him something higher. So when Krishna was speaking uh, Bhagavad Gita to Arjun, Arjun already was standing on a platform of knowledge. He was already a super knowledgeable person. Therefore, what Krishna gave him was much higher than what he knew or he understood. And when Jesus Christ was giving knowledge to the fishermen, they were at a certain level of knowledge. And therefore, Jesus Christ had to elevate them from where they were. And that is how the whole idea of knowledge sharing happens. You know, the pocket dictionary has all the words that are there in the chambers dictionary. But all the words that are there in the chambers dictionary is not in the pocket dictionary. So similarly, many religions are like pocket dictionaries. They give you the essence of, of what you need to know. But if you want to know complete knowledge, Go there. Chambers Dictionary is waiting for you. Just to give you a very interesting record of the way these scriptures were put down, you know. As I said, the word Sanatana means eternal. This knowledge was there eternally. But till about 5,000 years back, this knowledge was never transmitted in a written format. Why? Because the people at that age were known as Sitidhara. What is the meaning of the word Shruti Dhara? The word Shruti Dhara means they hear once and remember forever. Now you and me, we are not even, we can't even remember one phone number now. What to speak of remembering all great details of the scriptures, right? I mean, at least 20 years back, 30 years back, we could remember 10, 15 numbers easily. But now most people don't even remember their wives or husband's number. You know, what to speak of other people, right? Memory is so low now. 5,000 years before, people could remember everything like that. But over a period of time, memory decreases. And Vyas Dev, Veda Vyas, who was the literary incarnation of the Lord, at some point in his meditation understood that there will be Kali Yuga products like all of us who are going to be so highly dependent on the mobile phone that it's so highly dependent on written knowledge, they cannot remember anything. So Ved Vyas decided to write down at that point. Till that point, till that point, all knowledge was known as Ved. What is the meaning of the word Ved? 
the word veda in english translates to knowledge veda doesn't mean religion veda doesn't mean knowledge of one particular subject veda means knowledge about everything in the world veda vyas first time he decided to write down compile the vedas veda vyas is not the author of the vedas the ved vedas predate uh, vyasdev also so he even he has not written down the vedas he only compiled it so vyasdev divided the entire gamut of the vedas into four categories rig yajur sama and atharva after he wrote the four vedas ved vyas started thinking from the point of view of the audience in the future he realized the kali future people of kali yuga are not going to be able to study the vedas read the vedas or understand the vedas because knowledge of the vedas requires solid understanding of sanskrit so he decided to make it simpler for us by writing what is known as the 108 upanishads after writing the four vedas he wrote the 108 upanishads what are 108 upanishads 108 upanishad are the same vedas vedic knowledge written in a condensed sutra form vedas are in the form of long prose very complicated prose upanishads are in the form of sutras very simple one sentence sutras so uh, after writing the upanishads ved vyas was very happy that i managed to condense the knowledge of the vedas into 108 upanishads more defined the vedas are an ocean you know how many way uh, how many verses are there in the vedas 1 lakh lakh verses 1 lakh lakh you can imagine it's, it's an ocean you will never end up finishing the finishing reading all the vedas but the upanishads are more defined concentrated 108 upanishads after writing the upanishads vyasdev realized these dull people won't even be able to understand the upanishads because the language of the upanishads are not exactly simple like the isha upanishad it speaks about you know very vague concepts tat ejeti tat nejeti tat dure tat va antike tat antarasya bahyasya it speaks a language that is a little complicated you know it says that of the uh, he is far and yet near he is inside and yet outside it's a little strange language that normal normal people can't understand so vyasdev after writing the 108 upanishads he decided to make it more simpler by writing the 18 puranas the purana the word purana means old stories purana so once upon a time you know so these are all old stories put together the same knowledge that is there in the vedas the same knowledge that is there in the upanishads is now in the puranas in the form of stories the puranas contain the same essential truth but in story form much easier to understand much easier to connect with therefore people love to read the puranas because it's much easier and a much relatable form vyasdev after writing the 18 puranas so divided the 18 puranas into three categories the puranas for people in the mode of ignorance people in the mode of goodness people in the mode of passion wonderful after writing the 18 puranas vyasdev still felt these guys are still not going to be able to understand everything nicely i want to make it more simple more basic he wrote then one long story and that's the mahabharat the entire mahabharat in 100000 verses the same essential truth that is there in the vedas that is there in the puranas that is there in the upanishads is there in the mahabharat in the mahabharat you know what, what vyasdev writes he writes look at his confidence he says if there is anything here in the mahabharat you will find it you so what he says is what is everywhere you will find it here and what is not here you will not find it anywhere look at his confidence look at the confidence of of vyasdev he saying if you don't find it in the mahabharat you will not find it anywhere i mean it's not that you know he's not talking about you know names of people he's not talking about he's talking about the essence the principles basically 
the mahabharata has everything after writing the mahabharat he felt i have done everything but somewhere he still felt i am not uh, i have not done complete justice then he went to his teacher narad muni and he asked his teacher narad muni why do i still feel dissatisfaction in my heart narad muni told him because you have not spoken the truth as it is he said you have written down everything but you have not written clearly who god is the vedas give very very vague explanation of god even the upanishads the the puranas give a very vague explanation of god mahabharat to some extent does it but it doesn't give very clear cut understanding of who god is so vyas narad muni tells vyas dev straight write something straight don't beat around the bush and then vyas dev wrote the most important literature of his entire career he wrote the shrimad bhagavatam the bhagavat puran is called after writing the shrimad bhagavatam vyas dev felt peaceful and relaxed he didn't have to write anything more so bhagavad gita is a part of the mahabharat by the way the bhagavad gita is a chapter in the mahabharat so it is very much in that uh, realm so vyas dev he was one who recorded all these scriptures now to help you see this in a little different perspective i'm going to give you some very interesting thoughts there are four types of religions in this world a four ways in which religion can be practiced four ways in which you can worship god the first way in which people worship god is out of fear uh fear is one of the most powerful emotions in the world many religions inspire people to worship god out of fear isn't it if you don't do this you will go to hell if you don't do this then this will happen to you if you don't do this the sky will crack and you will you will die you know i mean they create so much fear in a person why so that you end up worshiping god so this fear based religion or fear based uh, you know understanding of spirituality religion you know god is something that is common that has been there for ages now isn't it so fear based religion fear based uh, worship is common stick waiting for you god is waiting with a stick you know and i'll tell you there are so many people who worship god because of the stick that's the lowest way of worshiping god that is the lowest reason to worship god fear see fear is important but you shouldn't create so much fear that people run away from god to create a limited amount of fear that people run towards god without fear you know i mean people won't follow any rules basically so some fear is required but you do not create so much fear in a person that a person runs away from god so many many religions function at this level at the level of fear and as i said this is the lowest level of functioning bhaya or fear the second level of of uh, worship of god is known as aasha or reward reward based religion is something that is very common today and almost every second person is into this reward based religion indians are used to bribing left right center they bribe the gods also you know? so you know kuch kaam karana hai jaake thoda you give some donation break a coconut you know give some offering and then work is done you know and there are such amazing and hilarious ways of in which indians can bribe god you know and such amazing ways in which indians connect with god go to tirupati balaji you know massive crowds and i'll tell you every single person standing in that crowd has a list in his pocket list of things that he's come to ask god for you know and why do why do you think people stand there for 24 hours 10 hours 12 hours so many hours why because they have a big list in their pocket and for that list they ready to sacrifice as much time as needed and finally most of these guys when they come in front of god you should see it you know if you stand if you go to tirupati you will understand what i'm talking of course not now but at least during the pre covid times uh, when people go and have darshan of the deities you know i mean how much time do you get to stand in front of tirupati balaji you know one second two seconds and you know what people do in that one two seconds that they are standing in front of the deities they close their eyes typically 
they are standing for 24 hours and when they come in front of the deities they close their eyes why because they don't want to forget anything in their list you know i mean if they see the beauty beautiful form of the lord they might forget something in their list you know they close their eyes just they, they want to narrate the whole list in front of the deities and to make it worse you know in hyderabad there is a temple known as visa balaji you know and people go there to worship the deity only to get a us visa they have hundred percent conviction. If you go to visa biology, you'll get US visa for sure. I mean, I think something that American consulate is still not considered, you know, as a part of their uh, legal procedure, darshan of visa biology. So imagine how much we are used to this reward business. You know, I go and do this, and this is what I get. You know, and temples are crowded by kids at a certain point in time. When a lot of kids come to the temple, I know for sure either their results are going to come or exam day it is. That is the only time kids come to the temple in big quantities, you know. I reward, you know, the whole idea of give and take. The third way of, a third reason why people worship God is out of a sense of duty. Beauty or kartavya is higher than reward and higher than fear. Um, the idea of beauty is connected with gratitude. Like for example, there was a small girl who was answering, uh, she was in a, in, a, in, a, in a class and her teacher asked all the students to write the seven wonders of the world. And this small girl, she was thinking a lot, you know, and after a lot of thinking, she was not uh, getting the answer. And then uh, the teacher was wondering why is she thinking so much and other students are writing, you know, Eiffel Tower and this and that and very really, uh, enthusiastically writing the seven wonders. And um, then later on, this teacher went to this uh, uh, student and she pulled out the paper to check what he wrote. And she wrote, the seven wonders of the world are two eyes, two ears, a nose. Imagine, you know, what her, what her thoughts are. You know? and do we ever think that these are wonders of the world? Do we ever, we take these them for granted, isn't it? We take all the things that we have just for granted. So a sense of duty means it's connected to a sense of gratitude that it's, it's not that I want something from God. God has already given me so much and I need to be grateful for what God has given me. And that's what worship at the, at the level of duty is. So while many religions, you know, inspire you to worship at the level of, uh, of uh, fear, and there are many religions that uh, are inspired to worship at the level of reward. There are some religions that inspire you to rise yourself to the level of beauty. Worship God as a sense of beauty. Worship God out of gratitude towards him for what he has already done for you. And then, so as I said, gratitude is much higher than fear and much higher than reward. But this is not the highest level of worship of God. There is something much higher than that. And that thing which is much higher than beauty is love. Love is the highest level of worship of God. Why you worship God? Not because I'm going to get something from him. Not because I'm, I'm, I fear him or if I fear losing something, if I don't worship him, not even because he has done so much for me. I worship him because I love him. Now this is the highest level of worship or this is the highest level of connection with God. A calf loves its mother. Now, why does a calf love its mother? Why does a mother love its calf? Does a calf love its mother because it provides milk? The mother provides milk. That's why I love. Or does it, does she, uh, does the calf love the mother because the mother gave birth to her? No, there is love. And in love, there is no question of expectation and there is no question of demand. Love is beyond expectation and demand, much higher than fear, much higher than reward, much even higher than even a sense of beauty. Gratitude or duty comes when I have received something from that person. You know, if somebody has given me a lot, I'm grateful to that person. But in love, there's no question of even expecting something to be grateful for. In love, whether a person gives me or doesn't give me, it doesn't matter. I just love that person. That's all. There's no sense of expectation. 
and that is the level of worship that we are talking about shrimad bhag so the idea of sanatan dharma it promotes us from the lower level of uh, worship to higher levels of worship now why are we talking about these four levels now you look at all religions of this world and you put them which category does it fall in you realize most religions fall in the first three categories most 90% fall in the first two categories very few come to this third category also and literally there is only one scripture that talks about the last level the level of love the scriptures that talk about the level of love are bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam these two scriptures talk about nothing less than love the bhagavatam doesn't even talk about fear doesn't even talk about reward it doesn't even talk about duty it talks only about the level of love so now you tell me what are we talking about so it's not that different religions are talking different things they're talking the same thing but at different levels you know every religion is at one at, at one level of introducing us to idea of connecting with god so my understanding is what do you aspire for that's what you should ask if you aspire for the highest then i can tell you what is the highest if you aspire for anything lower then you shouldn't continue in this in this course beyond this because beyond this we are not going to talk about anything lower than love we are not talking about anything lower than you know ha- having the highest aspiration for understanding god or connecting with god so going forward we'll talk about the whole idea of love in more deeply okay so we spoke about how there is only one god but the god, same god has many names and then we spoke about how so many religions are simply to help us so many religions and so many scriptures are to help us reach higher levels of love or higher levels of connecting with god so according to what level you want you go to a particular religion you go to a particular book particular scripture if you are satisfied at this level go to one scripture one religion if you want a higher level go to another scripture another religion if you want a much higher level go to another scripture another religion if you want a much much higher level you go to another scripture that's the whole idea so the levels of different religions are actually the ways in which uh, you know your connection with god can be uh, found understood uh, connect appreciated right now we'll address a very interesting aspect of god which is the form aspect does god have a form this is something that many many people have misunderstood not understood seldom sometimes even asked so what is the understanding of does god have a form the scriptures give a very interesting answer the scriptures give a beautiful example to help us understand this what is the example that is given the example of the sun and the sunshine now does the sun have a form or is it formless obviously sun has a form isn't it we see it we see that sun has a defined form but the sunshine that comes out from the sun is formless can you give form to sunshine you can't it's formless similarly god has a form and also has a formless aspect to him just like the sun which has a form and sunshine is a formless aspect of the sun similarly god has a form and he also is, has a formless aspect to him i'll explain what it means in in some time you know one of my friends was traveling in a flight and uh, he met a man that was sitting next to him and when he saw that when this man saw that you know this person was dressed in dhoti kurta shaven head having tilak and all he immediately picked up a discussion he asked him how do you worship how do you worship a god that has a form immediately first question not even asked his name just straight away first question and this friend of mine he gave a very brilliant answer beautiful answer he asked him do you pray he said of course i pray five times a day i pray definitely this friend asked him if you pray 
does god hear your prayers he said of course god hears my prayers 100% otherwise why would i pray so he said if your god hears your prayers does he have ears he said yes yes of course god has ears so then he asked him if he has ears don't you think he has a face also he said no he doesn't have a face so essentially according to him god appears like this two ears koi kaan bas do kaan hai no face how is it possible that god has only two ears and no face only you know so when you say that i am praying to god when you say that you expect god to hear you he also has to have a face he also has to have a form in fact the understanding that the scriptures give us is that we have taken the form of god it's not that you know so see the the way in which we are created the way in which human beings are created we are created in the form of the lord what does it mean let's let's give a uh, let's let's uh, understand this a little deeper there's a difference between our form and god's form god has no material form like for example there was a um, a man who was going to somebody's house to beg for charity sadhu and just when he was going inside you know to the house he overheard something happening inside the house the mother and the small child they were talking to each other and the mother was telling the child eat the tiger the child is saying no no i will not eat the tiger i'll eat the elephant today and the sadhu was standing outside was hearing this conversation he was shocked imagine you know mother and child talk about eating a tiger and eating an elephant he ran away from there because he was scared you know these are very dangerous entities inside he didn't find out what they were talking about they were talking about you know this sugar candies you have seen these small sugar candies in in our childhood we used to have sugar candies of made of different shapes you know so the, the mother was telling the child eat the tiger sugar candy which is in the shape of a tiger the child is saying no no i'll eat the elephant one you know? so if you look at sugar candies what what are sugar candies in essence externally they are having a form right they having a beautiful form they having different like for example uh, i don't know how many of you all have seen these gi joe gems you know you can get these gi joe toys you open them up inside that lot of gems are there you know chocolates stored inside kids love this isn't it so externally it looks like a toy But you open the toy inside. There's a lot of chocolate filled inside. That's how all of us are. Externally, we have a plastic form. You know, we have a material form. But internally, we are spirit soul, which is pure Satchidananda, pure spirit, spiritual entities. But God, externally and internally, is spiritual. It's not that He has a body like us. god's external internal there is no difference at all pure spirit so so god has no material form like us so we have a material form inside that the spiritual form is there the spirit soul is there but god externally also has no material form so when we and the formless aspect of god is a light emitting from god just like the sun emits sun's rays right similarly from the body of the lord there is a particular type of light that is emitted it is known as brahma jyoti brahma jyoti is the formless aspect of god so there are many people who get so attracted to the light that comes out from god they don't want to go any further they are satisfied with that with seeing that light so when they see the light aspect of god they say that's it i don't want to go any further and that light aspect of god is the formless aspect of god if you go beyond the formless aspect of god then you will see the beautiful form of god right so god has no material form he has a formless spiritual energy or light that emits from him and god has a beautiful spiritual form these are three ways in which we understand the aspect of god the form aspect of god right now 
we spoke about uh, why so many religions, why so many scriptures. We spoke about God having, you know, why so many names of God. We spoke about all that. And then we spoke about the fourth thing, which is the formless aspect of God. Now we're going to talk about the most important part of this discussion today. What is it? Who is that one God? When we say that there's only one God in this world and the same God is worshipped by different names and different ways, you know, who is that one God? So I am going to uh, keep or stick to the reference of Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, which as I said, is the highest level of understanding God, especially at the level of love. So I'm keeping those scriptures as our reference points and going further into the discussion. What does the Gita and what does the Srimad Bhagavatam speak about? Who is that one God? The Bhagavatam and the Gita speaks about that one God being Lord Krishna. Why does the Bhagavatam say that Krishna is that one God? Krishna means all attractive. All attractive means that in that all attractiveness is encompassed all the qualities. A person who is all attractive is also all powerful, is also all merciful, is also all uh, you know pleasing every way. Now, why do we say Krishna is God? Do we say Krishna is God because we like black? And Krishna is black in color, and therefore Krishna is God. Do we say Krishna is God because you know he plays a flute and I love flute, therefore he is God? Do we say Krishna is God because he is he he steals everything? You know, he's makanchor and he's a thief. I also like to steal once in a while. So you know, Krishna is God, according to me. Or do we say Krishna is God because he flirts a lot with the girls? And I also like to flirt, and therefore Krishna is God. No, these are not the reasons why we call Krishna God. We are calling Krishna God based on the authority of the scriptures. In the, in the Brahma Samhita, it is said, Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarvakarana Karana. Very beautiful verse in the Brahma Samhita that says, Ishwara Parama Krishna. Ishwara means that he is the controller, supreme controller. Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchidananda Vigraha Vigraha means he has a beautiful form, Sachidananda form. And it says Anadir Adir. He is beginningless and he is endless. And he says Sarva Karana Karana. He is the cause of all causes. Anadir Adir Govinda Sarva Karana Karana. That is what the Brahma Samhita says. So like that, there are so many uh, scriptures that speak about the authority of, of Krishna being God. So why does, so now if you look at any of the scriptures, like for example, Jesus Christ, he, he always said, I'm the son of God. Prophet Muhammad, he said, I'm a prophet of God. Uh, Moses, he said, I'm a messenger of God. Guru Nanak, he said, I'm a teacher. Buddha, he came to teach us. And Mahavir, he's a perfected soul. Now, let us put Krishna on these two definitions. You remember, we had two definitions of God, isn't it? We said if anyone claims himself to be God, then that person should fit into these two definitions. What are the two definitions of God we spoke about? First is spec, supreme source, proprietor, enjoyer, and controller. And the second definition was Bhagavan, the one who possesses six opulences in completeness. So let us try to see if Krishna actually matches and fulfills these two definitions that we spoke about. So first is we spoke about the authority of the scriptures. If you want to understand who your father is, you ask your mother. So scriptures are like a mother and they reveal who our father is. And we, as I said, so many scriptures talk about the Godhood of Krishna. Like for example, I'm going to quote from the Bhagavad Gita. So here is a verse in the Bhagavad Gita that defines Krishna's uh, being the speck, supreme source, proprietor, enjoyer, and controller. So here the verse in the Bhagavad Gita says, Bhumi apo analo vayu, kham mano buddhi evacha. It says, uh, it, it actually lists the five uh, elements. Bhumi, earth, apo analo vayu, 
so it it talks about the different elements it talks about earth it talks about water it talks about fire it talks about kham the word kham means uh, ether it talks about air so these are five things it talks about and then it talks about man buddhi evacha man is mind buddhi is intelligence evacha etc kam mano buddhi evacha ahankara iti emme he says that the sixth the eighth element it talks about is ahankar which is the false ego so look at this krishna is saying earth water fire air ether mind intelligence and false ego all these are emanating from me this is verse number 7.4 of bhagavad gita you can note down this verse and you know go through it if you like krishna is claiming that i am the source of all these elements and then krishna in the next verse which is 7.5 he goes further and he speaks about how he is the source of the spirit soul also he says that aparyam itastvam tva anyam prakritim vidyame param jiva bhuta mahabaho yeyedam dharyate jagat he says that aparyam itastva anyam he says beyond these eight elements there is another element what is the other element talk on the spirit soul the atma and he says jiva bhuta mahabaho he says yeyedam dharyate jagat so he says Uh, he speaks about even that the atma also krishna is a source of so in these two verses <coughs> krishna claims himself to be the source of the subtle for the gross body the subtle body and the spirit spiritual body all the three and then here is a beautiful verse <coughs> this is um Bhagavad Gita 10.2. So Krishna says, "Aham adir hi devana." He says, "I am the source of the gods also, devatas." He says, "I am the source of all the gods." And here is another beautiful verse from the Shrimad Bhagavatam. You can note down this verse 1.3.28 of the Bhagavatam, where Krishna. So basically, in this section of the Bhagavatam, the third chapter of the first canto of Bhagavatam. the first 27 verses <clears throat> talk about the different incarnations of the lord the leela avatars the guna avatars the manvantara avatars the huge list of all the incarnations of the lord and then this verse number 28 comes this verse says ete chamsa kalapam sam krishnastu bhagwan swayam it says of all the list of different personalities that has been mentioned so far what does this verse say krishna's to bhagavan swayam it says krishna is swayam bhagavan that's what this verse concludes with so this is the uh, another verse here is another very interesting uh, episode in krishna's you know journey of life <clears throat> so when we say that krishna is the source of all avatars what does it mean matsya kurma varaha narsingha parashuram ram krishna balaram himself buddha kalki all these appear from this from krishna now there are two episodes in krishna's life where krishna actually shows his godhood in completeness when krishna was a little baby and he was about 5 years of age living in vrindavan with his mother yashoda one time all the friends of krishna went to mother yashoda and complained to yashoda that krishna is eaten mud so as a mother yashoda was very concerned she came running out and she demanded krishna open his mouth and show krishna said no no i have not eaten mud he was very innocently saying i have not eaten mud but mother yashoda was just not ready to agree she told him open your mouth i want to see right now and krishna opened his mouth and when yashoda peeped into the mouth of krishna she was amazed you know what she saw inside the mouth of krishna she saw the entire universe inside the mouth of krishna it seemed that she was peeping into a infinite space she was seeing every single planet she was seeing the sun she was seeing the moon she was seeing so many things 
and inside the mouth of Krishna, she saw Vrindavan. And in Vrindavan, she saw herself looking into the mouth of Krishna. And Yashoda was amazed. She actually saw the universal form of the Lord within Krishna's little mouth. And then another time was when Krishna showed Arjun the Virat root in the, on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. In the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, you'll actually see Arjun uh, being shown the entire Virat root. The Virat root of, of Krishna has practically every single element in the universe in one place. All the devatas, all the elements of the world, sun, the moon, everything, the rivers, the mountains, the sky, everything is in the Virat Rupa of the Lord. And that's how we understand that Krishna is that supreme source, proprietor, enjoyer and controller of everything. The second definition is Bhagavan, the one who possesses six opulences and completeness. So I'm going to speak about how Krishna is Bhagavan and how he possesses these six opulences and completeness. The first opulence is wealth. Obviously, when it comes to wealth, there's one personality that everybody wants to worship and follow. Who's that? Lakshmi Devi. There is no one in this world who doesn't do Lakshmi Puja. You know? I mean, you might miss any other puja, but Lakshmi Puja is something that you don't want to miss. Why? People love Lakshmi, right? But the problem with Lakshmi Devi is that Lakshmi is a chaste wife of Lord Narayan. If you do not invite the husband, the wife runs away. So Lakshmi is called Chanchala because she doesn't stay in a place where Narayan is not there for too long. And therefore, if you want Lakshmi to become stable, you have to worship Lakshmi Narayan not only Lakshmi. So Lakshmi is the goddess of fortune and she's the wife and one of the names of the Lord is known as Lakshmi Pati. What is the meaning of Lakshmi Pati? Lakshmi Pati means he's the, he's the husband of the goddess of fortune. And imagine. So Lakshmi is someone that everybody is after, but the one person Lakshmi is after is Krishna. And Krishna is the husband of the goddess of fortune. So if somebody is rich, like somebody is a multi-millionaire, billionaire, you know, richest person in the world. So the person, the richest person in the world doesn't have the money of the second richest person in the world, isn't it? Second richest person has more, has some money, obviously not more than the first richest person, but the first richest person doesn't have the money of the second richest person. So Krishna is Lakshmi Pati. Everybody's wealth belongs to Lakshmi Devi. She is the goddess of fortune. All the wealth in this universe belongs to Lakshmi. And Lakshmi belongs to Krishna. And therefore, he is all opulent when it comes to wealth. So all the wealth in this world belongs to him, basically. The second opulence is that of strength. You know, uh, there are many people in this world who are strong. Can live you know, 500 kilos, you know, 600 kilos, huge amounts of weight for a few seconds. And they get a gold medal. They get different awards for lifting for a few seconds. And here is a story. The Krishna, when he was a seven year old child, lifted the entire Govardhan hill in the little finger, little, I mean, what can you do with a little finger? Can you do anything with your little finger? You can't do anything with your little finger. That's one thing that is the most useless part of our body, you know, little finger. And Krishna lifted an entire Govardhan hill in the little finger of his left hand and held it up for seven days and seven nights. You know, when this painting was being drawn by some of Srila Prabhupada's disciples, one, one lady who was a Westerner was drawing this painting. And when she drew this painting for the first time, she made Krishna very muscular bulging muscles, chest was bulging out. Krishna was sweating as he was lifting this Govardhan hill, you know. And Prabhupada saw this painting of Krishna sweating, like, you know, Hercules, the typical, uh, you know, example of Hercules lifting the earth, sweating like anything at all, strained face, muscles. Prabhupada said, hey, this is not Krishna. And Prabhupada explained to this, this girl, this lady, that Krishna is lifting such a heavy hill, but for him, it is not heavy at all. It's like a small child lift, lifting a mushroom. 
you know how much effort the small child has to put to lift the mushroom is it really tough to lift the mushroom not at all so kropa told her though he is lifting such a heavy thing he is not straining at all and you don't make him have these bulging muscles and all he doesn't have to have all these bulging muscles even without that he will lift he can lift the entire universe so krishna is all strong not only is lifting this little govardhan hill on his little finger but in the form of ananta shesh the supreme lord holds all the universes on his head all the universes are on the head of ananta shesh another form of the lord the third opulence is the uh, the third opulence is the opulence of beauty in this world people are mesmerized by the, by beautiful beautiful people isn't it miss world miss universe any beautiful actor or actress people are mesmerized by beauty but you know krishna's beauty is far far superior let me just give you some uh, understanding it is explained that the most beautiful person in this world in this material world is like a cockroach compared to people in the heavenly planets so miss world or miss universe of this world is like is like you know less beautiful than a cockroach in the heavens and the most beautiful person in the heaven is literally like a frog compared to people in the spiritual world and in the spiritual world everyone is so beautiful now all the beautiful people in the spiritual world it is explained shrimati radha rani is the most beautiful and when shrimati radha rani looks at krishna she gets mesmerized you can imagine how beautiful krishna is you know uh, there was one uh, cupid cupid is the god of love isn't it so once he was kamadev you know he was trying to shoot an arrow at krishna the cupid makes everybody stupid isn't it in this world that's the role of cupid and you know, i making all of us stupid so kamadev one time he saw krishna and he wanted to shoot an arrow at krishna to mesmerize him but when kamadev saw krishna he fainted the beauty of krishna was so amazingly superior and therefore one of the names of krishna is known as madana mohan that means the one who has mesmerized cupid himself so uh, in in from a beauty perspective it is explained that krishna's beauty is far far superior than any beauty in this world and as far as knowledge is concerned krishna spoke the bhagavad gita when krishna spoke the 700 verses of the bhagavad gita on the battlefield of kurukshetra in 45 minutes literally now what krishna spoke was not a prepared dialogue krishna wasn't learning verses the previous day because he has to speak bhagavad gita the next day to arjun what krishna spoke was a spontaneous speech the spontaneous words came out from krishna's mouth you know what krishna spoke that day spontaneously 5000 years later we are still trying to understand what it means that is a depth of knowledge that krishna's words have i mean so many books written to give commentary to that bhagavad gita so imagine what kind of knowledge krishna has and not only the gita all the scriptures are written by vyas dev and vyas is a incarnation of krishna only he is a is considered to be the literary incarnation of krishna veda vyas and he is called as krishna dwaipana vyas so he is a literary incarnation of the lord so that all that knowledge that vyas possesses is krishna's knowledge only and as i said the knowledge that krishna possesses is so amazing and so deep the next opulence is known as uh fame so we saw uh beauty we saw strength we saw uh wealth we saw knowledge now the fifth one fifth opulence is known as uh fame you know whatever krishna does he becomes famous for it if he steals butter from somebody's house he becomes famous for it as makan chor If he runs away from a battlefield, also he becomes famous for it. Run short. Whatever Krishna does, he becomes famous for it. You know, see, fame is something that people are dying to have today, isn't it? And all these TikTokers and YouTubers and and all these people are just dying to become famous. And everybody wants to become famous overnight. But the reality is, fame is so limited today. Now, you may be known to one million people, 
but what about the remaining uh, you know 7 billion minus 1 million people you know they don't even know you they don't know that you exist also right and what to speak of people in other universes so there might be someone who has 100 million people known in this world but he is you know the heavenly planets people won't even recognize this guy's name you know they won't even know that such a person existed in this world so even if you are known a lot in this world how much are you known you go to the jungles of africa do people know you people even care for you right so fame is very limited in, in today's world krishna is not only famous in this world he is famous all over in all the universes it's not only this world the small little earth that we're talking about we're talking about unlimited universes where there is unlimited living entities existing krishna is all famous and the idea of uh, renunciation is the most powerful idea see we spoke about krishna as all wealth all wealthy all knowledgeable all strong all beautiful all uh, knowledgeable all famous five and the sixth one is all renounced what is the meaning of all renounced what is the meaning of renunciation first of all see if i go to the rbi reserve bank of india and stand in front of rbi and i declare i renounce the reserve bank of india i give up does it make any sense i mean who are you to give up you didn't have it first of all for you to give it up you know see if you have wealth and you give it up then it makes sense right if you are a bhikari you don't have any money only and i give it up you know what are you talking about somebody who is all powerful all knowledgeable all wealthy all famous you know all uh, strong such a person can also be all renounced and you i'm going to give you two examples of how do krishna has all the f- other five opulences he also has the opulence of renunciation i'm giving two examples from the mahabharata first example is uh when the rajasu yagya happened of yudhishthir maharaj all different personalities were called in the rajasu yagya to do different things you know and all the brothers were given different tasks arjun was you know made to welcome guests uh karna was uh, you know asked to do charity uh, bhima was made to do cooking in the kitchen duryodhan was asked to collect gifts so like that different people took different roles in the rajasu yagya in the family you know what role krishna took in the rajasu yagya he took two roles that shows what kind of an amazing person krishna was the first role that krishna took was to receive the footwear of the guests and wash their feet imagine i mean he, here is the most wealthy person in the entire universe the most beautiful most knowledgeable person in the entire universe what is he doing washing the feet of the guests who are coming into the uh, rasu yagya wash the feet of every person that walked in and the second duty that krishna took up was after all the sadhus ate food krishna took the duty of collecting the pattal the juta plates of all the sadhus imagine it up somebody who has so much who collects the juta plates of anyone tell me you you go to a big man's house you won't find the owner collecting juta plates right they have 10 servants who are doing that Imagine Krishna is doing this. The second story, amazing story in the Mahabharata. You see this picture that is in front of you. This is a picture of Krishna driving Arjun's chariot, isn't it? So who becomes a driver? I mean, you won't find billionaires becoming a driver, isn't it? And let me tell you what it means to be a driver in those days. So when a chariot driver is sitting and driving chariots, the passenger at the back. has to communicate to the driver isn't it and you know the 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 fighters are are fully busy their hands are busy shooting and their mouths are busy chanting mantras so how does a chariot how does a fighter communicate to the driver you know what the fighter used to do is to kick the driver with their feet if arjun wants krishna to go to the left he kick him on the left if he wants krishna to go to the right he kick him on his right for 18 days from morning to evening Arjun was kicking Krishna left right center. 
imagine now tell me is anybody ready to become a driver in uh, you know in the mahabharat war like that who can do that unless you are really you know renounced and don't have a ego which is so big you know krishna voluntarily did this it's not that he didn't know that he's going to get kicks he did it voluntarily that shows the kind of renunciation that krishna has so krishna is known as bhagavan because he has all these six opulences in completeness and uh, now the question is obviously if krishna is supreme what about the others to help us understand uh, about everybody else let me explain to you all a concept known as the four tatvas this is a very important concept that all of us must understand it's very important to understand about all these great personalities okay there are four tatvas that the scriptures talk about the first tatva is known as the super soul or it's also called the vishnu tatva so what is vishnu tatva under the vishnu tatva comes all the uh, incarnations of the supreme lord krishna vishnu matsya narsingha rama buddha kalki all the incarnations of the lord fall under the category of what is known as vishnu tatva so if you if you understand it rightly vishnu tatvas they are not living entities they are not jeevas like us so what is the meaning of li- living entity living entity means they are an external body and internally there is a spirit soul that's what a living entity means right vishnu tatvas are not living entities they are internally and externally fully spiritual the supreme lord it's not that he has an external body and internally he is a soul no he is completely what is known as the spirit soul uh the second which is the uh, the second tatva so the first is vishnu tatva the second tatva is known as shakti tatva in shakti tatva comes all the energies of the lord radha sita lakshmi devi durga devi all the energies come under the category of shakti tatva the third tatva is known as shambhu tatva there is only one person in shambhu tatva that is lord shiva there is nobody else in this tatva shambhu tatva is a special category among the four tatvas very special category only lord shiva comes into this category so he is not an ordinary living entity at the same time he is not the supreme lord he is in between the example that is given in the brahma samhita is from milk curd comes isn't it but from curd milk cannot come so lord shiva is like curd and lord vishnu is like milk so from milk curd originates that's what the brahma samhita explains in a very beautiful way so shambhu tatva is a very special category of tatva as i said he is not an ordinary living entity he doesn't have a material form like all of us but at the same time he is not the supreme lord also he is in between it's called shambhu tatva i will explain about shambhu tatva more details in the next session but this is the essence the fourth tatva is known as jiva tatva what is jiva tatva jiva tatva definition is very simple the definition of jiva tatva is externally there is a body and internally there is a spirit soul internally spiritual but externally material so in this category comes human beings animals birds fishes demons even the gods the devatas come under the jiva tatva category that means indra has a physical form but internally is a spirit soul brahma has a physical form but internally he is a spirit soul that means somebody else can become indra also indra is a post that somebody else can occupy brahma somebody else can become brahma also it's a post so like that all the devatas are posts that somebody else can occupy so a living entity who is qualified to become brahma can become brahma that's what it means we'll explain this a little more deeper in some time okay so remember these four tatvas there is vishnu tatva there is shakti tatva there is shambhu tatva and there is jiva tatva so these are four tatvas 
Now, before I get into a little more discussion, I'm sure there is one question in your mind. Is Krishna incarnation of Vishnu or is Vishnu an incarnation of Krishna? How do you understand this? To help us understand this, let me give you some examples. I'm sure all of you all have seen Amitabh Bachchan, right? And I'm, see, I'm sure you've seen Amitabh Bachchan in so many roles, you know, he can appear as Shainsha, he can appear as Sharabi, you know, he can appear as Anthony, he can appear as, you know, Puli, uh, uh, right? so many roles he can appear. But isn't it the same person who appears in different roles? Isn't it? The same person can appear as different roles. Similarly, the same Supreme Lord appears in different incarnations. Here, look at this verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Yadayadahi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata abhyuktanam adharmasya tadatmanam sijamiyaham. Krishna says, whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practices for descendant of Bharata and a prominent rise of religion, I, at that time I descend myself. So to help you understand in very simple words whether Krishna is incarnation of Vishnu or Vishnu incarnation of Krishna, the answer is both are the same. Only they in two different roles. Like for example, if a person goes to office, how does he go to office? Dressed in a suit, in a formal dress, tie, formal pants, you know, shoes, very formal looking, right? When you see somebody in an official setup, it, it gives, generates awe and reverence, isn't it? The same person when he's at home, chaddi, banyan, you know, lungi, and very informal, you know. Now, if somebody who sees the person, like say, for example, you see a prime minister of a country in the office, very nicely dressed and all that, go to his home and see him in chaddi and banyan, you say, oh my God, you can't get shocked. That's him at home, isn't it? So Krishna is him at home. So Krishna is, when he's at home in Vrindavan, his home, he is the way he is. But when he takes an official role, he becomes very serious. You will not see Mahavishnu doing Masti. You will not see Vishnu doing, you know, having any, uh, you know, stealing people's houses. You will not find Vishnu doing something really mischievous. Very formal, very defined, the smile also is calculated, very formal role. That is the official role of the Lord. And the same Lord, when he comes at home, he is himself, full-fledged full himself. The question is, is he, is he two different people? No. Same person, just in two different roles. That's all. That's the way we understand this subject. To help us understand a little further, just to go into a little technical details. Look at this. If you can see this chart, Krishna is the origin. You know, Ishwara Parama Krishna, Satchidananda Vigraha, Anadi Radhi Govinda Sarvakarana. The, the one person that we call as God is Krishna. And from Krishna, the first personality that appears is known as Balaram. Balaram is the first expansion of Krishna. And from Balaram comes four personalities, VSPA. Can you see this on the chart? VSPA stands for Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, Aniruddha. These are four forms that appear from Balaramji. And from Sankarshan appears a form which is known as Narayan. If you can see, there's a, there's a image or there's a small picture of Narayan over here. From Narayan comes a secondary VSPA. Uh, Vasudeva, Sankarshan, Pradyubda, Nirudha. This is a second. This is a different uh, um, form. And from the secondary Sankarshan comes Mahavishnu. From Mahavishnu appears Garbhuda Kshay Vishnu. From Garbhuda Kshay Vishnu appears the Paramatma or Shirdha Kshay Vishnu. And from Shirdha Kshay Vishnu appears all the gods, the Devatas. And all the living entities, all of us also, to a great extent. So this is the categorization. And this is the way in which all the appearances happen. Okay? Don't worry if you don't understand much here. Tomorrow we're going to go in. Uh, so the next session, we're going to go in great details about this. Okay. This was just to give you all a rough idea. Now, let me just give you a simple example to help you understand everything else. Suppose there is a CEO of an organization. So under the CEO, there are many administrative heads, isn't it? There's a sales head, there's a finance head, there's a purchase head, there's a research head, human resources head, there's an administration head. So all these heads are there under a CEO. 
you consider this entire universe to be a company an organization a massive organization the ceo of the organization is krishna and under krishna there are many heads you know the person who is in charge for rains is indra the person who is in charge for light is surya the person who is in charge for heat is agni the person who is in charge for the water department is varuna the person in charge for vegetation is chandra the vegetables get their taste from the moon the uh, the person in charge for air is vayu the person in charge for finances is lakshmi devi the person in charge for treasury is kubera the person in charge for defense is durga devi the person in charge uh, the commander in chief of the of, of the gods is kartikeya the education minister the education department is under saraswati placement officer yamaraj decides where who will go next you know the whole idea of how the bodies are given you know and then the construction department is brahma ji so like that you find that uh, the ceo is one but there are many other devatas who are administrative in charges there's only one krishna but there are 33 crore demigods they explained the position of krishna is eternal now krishna doesn't change there's only one krishna and there will always be only one krishna but the demigods have a temporary post indra changes you know varuna changes surya changes brahma changes all the devatas they all change their post that means right now the one who is most qualified gets their post after some time somebody more qualified comes and if that this person turn gets over there's a change like indra the one who performs 100 ashwamedha yagyas perfectly gets to become indra next somebody who has lived a life of 100 celestial years without making one single mistake that person gets to become lord brahma according to what your qualification is you get a particular post but the post is temporary the residence of the lord of krishna the is called goloka vrindavan is an eternal place but swarga where the where the uh, devatas reside it's a temporary residence that means as long as they occupy that post they get to stay in swarga but after that uh, the post is over they can't stay there not only they can stay there even their residence itself is temporary we'll explain why the residence is temporary tomorrow the next session when we discuss on uh, the, the whole uh, creation uh, krishna the only thing krishna does you know one guy he uh, westerner came to india and uh, traveled around india and uh, you know at the end of his tour he said uh, you know i went to all the temples i i am i i am convinced that krishna is god so somebody asked him and how are you so convinced that krishna is god you know this guy said krishna is the only one who is enjoying everybody else is doing some work you know somebody has a trishul somebody has a damru somebody has different different things and they seem to be doing work they seem to be occupied in some some duty basically and look at what krishna is doing playing flute enjoying himself you know so krishna doesn't do any duties as such He is just enjoying himself. Everybody else has administrative duties. To help us understand this even better, let me give you a tell you a story from the Mahabharat. And this is the story about the origin of the Mahabharat. A very beautiful story. When Vyasadev was wanting to write the Mahabharat, he was looking for a scribe, somebody who will help him write down the Mahabharat. So somebody suggested that Lord Ganesh is the best person to you know write. So Vyasadev approached Ganesh. and he told ganesh that can you please help me write the mahabharat and i am going to write a very important book ganesh said i i i can help you but i have a condition vyasadev said what is your condition he said i'll keep writing as long as you keep speaking the moment you stop i will walk away and imagine what a pressure on the author you know so vyasadev said fine he agreed but on a condition what was his condition his condition was <clears throat> three things ganesh should first hear what vyasadev is saying second understand what vyasadev is saying and third 
accept what Vyasadeva is saying and only then write it. That was Vyasadeva's condition. So Ganesh had no problem. He is very intelligent. He can understand very fast. So he said, fine. And then Vyasadeva began writing the Mahabharata. And as Vyasadeva was speaking, Ganesh was writing very, very fast. Imagine, Ganesh heard everything, understood everything, and accepted everything, and only then wrote it. Hmm. In the Mahabharata is Gita. And in the Gita is so many verses that declare Krishna as a Supreme Lord. And Lord Ganesh hears it, accepts it, and only then writes it down. So who wrote the Gita? Technically, the writing of the Gita was done by Ganesh only. So Lord Ganesh is the scribe of Vyasadeva. And Mahabharata is, a, a, Gita is a part of the Mahabharata, basically. And therefore, this knowledge that we have speak about has been accepted and understood, accepted and written down by, by Lord Ganesh himself. <clears throat> Krishna's abode is eternal. Krishna's position and Krishna as a person, his body is eternal. But the demigods have temporary bodies. It is explained that the demigods, they have a, a fabulous, fabulously long life. But even their life comes to an end. The demigods, they have four very important uh, features in their body. The first feature of, the, of a body of a devata is their eyes never blink. Their eyes never blink. If you see someone around you whose eyes are not blinking, understand he is not an ordinary person. He's a devata. <laughs> the second quality of a devata is that they don't walk on the ground. They walk one inch above the ground. I'm not talking about heels here. Actually, they walk one inch above the ground. You know? Third quality of the devata is that they wear garlands. And the garlands never fade. They have flowers. The garland never fades. The fourth quality of the devatas is that their body is effulgent. It shines literally. Interestingly, these devatas live in the heavens fabulously long life. But at some point when their duration of stay in the heaven is getting over, their karma gets over, amount of time that they are allowed to stay gets over, then these four things start fading away. The eyes start blinking suddenly. They are, they start walking more on the ground, you know, <laughs> they get grounded and they are garland start feeding. One flower gets rotten, you know, and their, their shine starts decreasing. Everyone in the heaven understands it's ka ho gaya time. Time up. He has to leave the heaven now. You know, there's a hospital in Mumbai that claims no one ever dies in a hospital. Absolute perfect record. You know what they do? When they come to know somebody is dying, they transfer him to another hospital. Nobody dies here. So in the heaven, nobody dies. Why? Because they're not allowed to die there. They're thrown out from the heaven. You know, they send somewhere else to die. And that's why I mean, many times these shooting stars, you see this, uh, it is explained that it's sometimes these devatas who are being sent down back to the earth. So the difference between the worshippers of Krishna and the worshippers of the devatas is very interesting. The worshippers of Krishna, those who worship Krishna, they believe in giving him out of love. The devatas, many of the worshippers of the devatas, they go to take from them. Everybody wants to take from different gods. You know, they want to go and take and take. People who worship Krishna, they love Krishna. They want to give. The worship of the devatas is to satisfy needs. Sorry, uh, satisfy wants. And the worship of Krishna is to satisfy. Like, for example, if a small child goes to a shop and asks the shopkeeper, give me chocolates and gives 100 rupees. What does a shopkeeper do? Does the shopkeeper ask the child, open your mouth, let me see your teeth first? No. The shopkeeper takes 100 rupees, immediately gives chocolates. Isn't it? But the mother or father will never do that. If the child goes to the mother and says, I want chocolates, I want chocolates, the mother will first say, open your mouth. Right? So a lot of times people hesitate to come to Krishna. Why? Because Krishna is our father. And as a father, he will not satisfy all our wants. He will satisfy your needs, but not satisfy your wants. I might want anything, 
but the father will not give you anything he will first see what you need and then only that he will fulfill but if you go to an uncle an aunt or somebody else you know they will give you whatever you want why because they have limited time to take care of you isn't it but the father is very worried and very particular about what he gives you the relationship between the demigod and the worshipper and even the benediction of the gods is temporary but krishna's benedictions are eternal because the relationship with krishna is more eternal so now the question is there are a total of 33 crore demigods how many can you worship on a logical logistical uh, practical manner you know so even if you worship all the demigods i say i want to worship all the 33 crore demigods you will have to worship 3819 demigods per second to worship all 33 crore of them i mean how can you worship so many first of all do you know the names of so many how many of them do you even know here right so you will know maximum like say you will tell indra varuna chandra you keep naming also you will maximum be able to name 30 or 40 and if you are really really good you might be able to reach 50 names after that you don't even know the rest of them do you know there is a demigod controlling your eyes when you blink your eyes there is a there is a devata in charge of that this is devata in charge of your you know uh, of your uh, evacuation system if that devata is very angry at you he might seal it and then you become constipated for days and days together that devata is very angry in america you know and so many people in america are heavily constipated 10 days 12 days nothing comes out you know imagine if you were if you upset the devata what happens every single part of our body not just part of our body every single part of the universe is controlled by some devata it's impossible to satisfy all of them it is impossible to worship all of them so the question is how will you even worship i mean even if we just do nothing else and only do 24 hours a day worship of all these kadidri ko demigods is it even practical and more than that each one of these gods requires a different method of worship some you have to worship in this way some you have to worship in this way some they like this particular flower some they like this particular flower some they like this particular leaf some they don't like this particular leaf how will you even manage to worship all of them it's just impossible for you to worship so many and therefore what is the practical way what is the solution for of it a very simple solution if you want to water a tree what do you do do you go and water every branch every twig every leaf every fruit every flower of the tree do you do that no you just water the root when you water the root the whole tree gets nourished isn't it so similarly the recommendation that the scriptures give you know is what is the root of the tree and what is the root of this root of the entire creation is krishna you simply worship krishna you're nourishing everyone else all the great personalities are automatically getting nourished to help us understand this a little better let me explain to you what i how i look at the whole picture just so that you understand it the way i look at the whole picture is i look at all of them as a big family krishna is the father shiva the radharani is the mother but all the other personalities lord shiva lord ganesh all these exalted personalities they are our uncles aunts some of them are our older brothers the older sisters it's a one huge family just because you're worshiping the father doesn't mean you disrespect everybody else in a family who is most important is nothing like that every member in the family is as important as the other so here when we understand the very culture in a more holistic way we understand it in a very clearly defined way from a, in a systematic uh, manner so when we worship krishna it doesn't mean that we disrespect everybody else everybody else have their roles in our lives and everybody else deserve the highest level of respect but we understand who is our father we understand who is our mother we understand the idea of divinity in a particular way in a particular order when we understand this whole subject matter in a very clear and very systematic manner there is no there is no question of confusion there is no question of you know getting uh, bewildered by the numbers 33 crores and all that you know 
there's no question of being confused who am i what is my connection with god who is god there's no confusion at all it's very very clear and is very very uh, simple of course uh, what i've explained is just the essence of this whole discussion the next session when we do the session number 5 we are going to go much deeper into this and that's when i'm going to show you all a diagram and this diagram will completely change your perspective of the whole creation you know in the way who we are who the gods are and you know what what the material world spiritual world is that that uh, image that diagram that i'm going to show you all the next time will give you all a much deeper perspective to what i'm speaking about today just now to summarize everything i spoke um we started by talking about how one god is known by different names it's uh, based on you you focus on one quality of that god and that name comes it doesn't mean they're different personality they're the same personality but addressed by different names then we saw there are many scriptures because there are many levels of people according to the level of the person there is a particular scripture that introduces us introduces us to uh, understanding god at that level and then we spoke about so many uh, uh, four levels we spoke about fear based religion uh, uh, you know reward based duty based and love based basically and then we spoke about how god has a form and uh, in fact he is source he is the form aspect of god is the source of the formless aspect of god also right we spoke about the sun and the sunshine that example and then we spoke about how krishna fits into the two definitions of god spec supreme source proprietor enjoyer and controller of everything and bhagavan the possessor of six opulences and completeness and then we spoke about in detail the difference between uh, krishna and the devatas and we spoke about the difference in the modes of worship of krishna and all the devatas with this we come to the end of today's uh, session uh, open it up for discussions any questions any doubts please do ask if anybody has any kind of doubts how or silly or how whatever it may be please do ask because this is a very very crucial and foundational uh, discussion of uh, understanding the gita If anyone has any questions, please you can feel uh -huh. free to type them, ask them, unmute yourself. Yes, by the way. Yeah, Guruji. Uh, 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 you mentioned about uh, Krishna's role as CEO, CEO and uh, eternal. You know, which doesn't change and uh, which is uh, uh, permanent. Whereas uh, the demigods and devtas like uh, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Brahma, or Indra, their roles will change. Well, one second yeah just one second before you go ahead just mention that only the jiva tatvas fall in the change category the first three mm -hmm. the vishnu tatva shakti tatva and shambhu tatva are not in the change category okay uh, uh, but you mentioned that krishna's role is eternal and permanent and uh, the others uh, other roles are temporary uh, does it mean i mean uh, to my understanding for example lakshmi or saraswati or uh, karna sorry uh, uh, brahma or indra they continue to do their uh, roles no so let me explain more in detail basically see brahma indra they are jiva tatva they fall in the jiva tatva category right shakti tatva is radha sita uh, lakshmi they fall in shakti tatva shakti tatva they are almost like vishnu tatva only right they are energies of the lord they are, they are direct emanations from the supreme lord so they are not living entities who take a form, take a particular role so lakshmi can never be replaced it's not that somebody else will become a lakshmi yes. in the future right so i am saying that shakti tatva uh vishnu tatva and shambhu tatva cannot be replaced they are eternal roles basically and this the jiva tatva category is what is replaceable as pose i mean uh, uh, sita and uh, all those uh, uh, commander uh, jiva tatva lakshmi saraswati uh, indra vayu deva they don't come under uh, jiva uh, tatva right no 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 i'm only lakshmi It doesn't come under Jiva Tattva. Indra, Vayu, Chandra, Varuna, all of them come under Jiva Tattva. Yeah, but their position is also apparently uh, permanent, isn't it? Because they, they continue want... to. 
they continue to do the, their roles uh, indra varuna right. agni continue yeah. to do the roles for ages and uh, right. so i'll tell you how it is the post is permanent but the person who is occupying that post changes just like prime minister is always going to be there in india but who is the prime minister is going to change isn't it the next prime minister who comes will also be known as prime minister only so the next person who occupies the role of indra will also be known as indra only okay the title will continue to remain same the ah, person will change yeah those are titles correct correct so correct. the person who is uh, like you said brahma if he is not made a single 100 uh, uh, 100 correct thing somebody else will replace brahma with a name correct. of brahma as such right uh, okay and clear clear fair rulish make sense now yes yes i'm clear thank you thank you thank you very much nagesh ji hari krishna prabhu ji Uh, so just a continuation of uh, balakrishna ji's question so once the occupants of devaloka or the or the jiva uh, category of gods once they retire what's their post retirement scheme like do they come uh-huh. among us or maybe they are a part of the session over here and yeah. second p- part of the question is uh, people in devaloka or in the higher worlds do they have an opportunity to go to uh to to vaikuntha loka or or is it or, or do they actually have to come down to earth and only the human beings have an option because i have heard different things about it i, I just wanted okay. to get it thank you for the question so from swarga so see there are categories of swarga also right there when we see the next time i'll actually show you the categorization of swargas there are seven seven heavens seven levels of heaven basically the highest is where brahma occupies it is known as satyaloka basically the swarga which uh, where the where the de- uh, demigods uh, are um, residing is a second level you know and there is five more levels above that and higher than that is satyaloka basically so brahma ji resides it is explained that all those who are in swarga loka usually they have to come back to the mrityu loka to the earth planet and then from the earth planet they go to the higher uh, realms the vaikuntha planets or the spiritual world basically but the exception is of the brahma brahma loka usually people who are at the level of brahma loka from there they go higher to the uh, to the vaikuntha planets and to the spiritual uh, realms basically but most other uh, devatas they come back to the earth and of course when they come back to the earth it's not that they're going to get a lower birth but they're going to get a very high birth from which they can elevate themselves and go ahead basically see the heavenly planets is like a very very high quality high end holiday package if you go for a high end holiday package sponsored by your company how long will the package continue at some point it ends right when the holiday ends you come back to your home only isn't it so heavenly planets is like going on a solid holiday i mean of course you you get to do some service there you know while uh, while there but it's a it's a high class stay it's a high class uh, accommodation it's it's great fun <laughs> okay so it's a staycation plus a remote work at a exotic yeah place. yeah yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> thank you prabhu ji thank you thank you ah uh, excuse me prabhu ji i have one question uh, my yes, name is rashmi Yes, uh, I'm not able to understand that when we say the God is having the form at the same time it is formless. Yeah. And when we see Krishna, right. uh, Krishna is like uh, we we give the form as a the in the Vrindavan what we saw which is the one of the altar of uh, Vishnu Tattva. Correct. Correct. The so I just want to understand the same altar of Vishnu Tattva and the origin. that is the father krishna both are same or it's right. a nomenclature yeah. some kind of confusion i am yeah. having that okay. let me explain very very good question it's a very thoughtful question that means you have been really paying attention that's good uh i, I didn't want to get into that discussion because it would confuse people but now that you have brought it up so let me explain what it is okay so as you rightly pointed out the origin is krishna right the father krishna okay now vishnu incarnates according to the cycle to the yuga you know there are 10 incarnations is the is only 10 that we know of 
for the number of incarnations of vishnu it is explained is as many as waves of an ocean that means how many incarnations of vishnu are there unlimited incarnations are there okay one of which is also krishna so now uh, there is something known as yuga cycle there are four yugas satya yuga treta yuga dwapara yuga kali yuga right we'll explain these four yuga, the yuga cycle next time when we I'll, I'll get into some very detailed explanation of it you'll get that much better next time but just to understand help you now i'll, I'll explain these cycles continue forever right so when satya yuga is over then treta yuga begins treta yuga is over dwapara yuga begins dwapara yuga is over kali yuga begins once kali yuga is over, over again a satya yuga begins it's cyclic right so now it is explained that once in a day of brahma so uh, what is a day of brahma in a day of brahma there are thousand yuga cycles that happen how many 1000 yuga cycles happen in one day of brahma once in a day of brahma krishna appears himself on the earth only once in a day of brahma okay the remaining 999 cycles the krishna the krishna that appears on the earth is an incarnation of vishnu only once in a day of brahma the the supreme lord himself appears the remaining 999 times it's a it's an incarnation of vishnu only got it so you are right in one sense and you are wrong in one sense that means only once in a day of brahma you will find the supreme lord who is our father descending himself to the world all other times it's an incarnation of vishnu who comes do you get what i'm saying not fully but somewhat i'm yeah, trying to understand yeah. that's why i'm saying that you your question will you will get a better answer for it in the next time because uh, i'm going to show you some numbers the next time you know so right now i'm talking to you theoretically right so you're not able to see those numbers So when I show you numbers and explain with those numbers, and when I show the diagram that I'm talking about, then it will fit more clearly in your mind. You know. So right now, just let it park it for now. Just let it be in, in the side. And the next time when we have this discussion on on Brahma's age, you know, and when I'm going to get into numbers, you will see some mind blowing numbers coming your way. You know, and I'm going to show you in the form of slides. You know, that's when you will understand in a more pictorial and in a more representational manner what i'm talking about make sense rashmi ji yes sir. yes yeah. thank you and please do if i if you don't get the answer to your question the next time please do ask again that that time i'll be in a better position to answer your question because you would have uh, seen those numbers and uh, and, the, and the diagram right so uh, yes okay thank I you ask a question yes please um Sorry, this is Girish. Yeah, uh, Girish. So, so you say okay, uh, Krishna is also an incar incarnation of Vishnu. What we see, I mean, so why two things? One, why why this confusion? Why have the same name, Krishna, Krishna? Could have been some other name. <laughs> one, one, and secondly, as far as I know, I mean, the form is the same, right? Yeah. What we know as the other original Krishna, and this Correct. even the form could have been different. Then there'll be no confusion. Yeah. <laughs> see there is no confusion in the sense that because we are discussing it in this way it seems confusing otherwise see like like let, let me just uh, you know help you with another example you know like say for example um you you just collapse the whole vishnu tatva together right the whole you know, i i showed you all that whole chart right that you know krishna comes balram balram comes all that you know just collapse the whole chart together just collapse it together it's only one person just like i was talking to you all uh, to all about amita bachchan right the one amita bachchan can have 10 roles so this 10 roles are for different movies for different purposes right so now somebody may have the capacity to do 10 roles and somebody might do only one role again and again and again So, if somebody has a capacity to do ten roles, why will he not do ten roles? If somebody has a capacity to do twenty roles, why will he not do twenty roles? Right? So, for you and me who do not have capacity to do more than one role, it's very confusing for us. 
because we are so limited in our understanding and our capacity right but the supreme lord is so unlimited in his capacity that he can do 10 different roles simultaneously and be successful at it and people won't even know it's the same person you get what i'm saying so i'm just saying just collapse the whole thing make it very simple for yourself at this point in time you know so as you go deeper you will understand more clearly at this point in time just understand one very simple thing is the same person who is doing one an official role and one an unofficial role so krishna is the lord himself in the in his swayam bhagwan form in the form at home basically playful fun loving very very jovial very beautiful very very reciprocating type of person that's him but when that same person takes an official role he takes on a very serious note he takes on a very serious role creation maintenance destruction it's a very serious role you know then he takes on that mahavishnu garudaksha vishnu that form which is a very serious type of agenda basically but you want to see krishna himself here yeah? he is there and why does he come down in in his same form very simple i'll just give you a very simple explanation now tell me if i want to sell you a product okay and i want to advertise a product to you how do i advertise it i advertise it by bringing a child right why do so many uh, you know products advertise with children why because people love children that's a very natural aff- aff- affection that people have towards kids why does krishna come in his own form sometimes in every cycle why does he that original form that comes you know only once in dev varma he himself comes but why the form keeps coming again and again because that's the most attractive form to attract us to the spiritual world see the krishna's incarnation is an advertisement for us krishna comes performs his beautiful pastimes in vrindavan why he is telling us baba this is a 3 minute movie if you like the 3 hour movie you have to pay and come there so krishna comes to the material world in acts his beautiful pastimes why simply to attract our hearts simply to attract our hearts and once we fall in love with him we said wow this is so amazing till say i am going i am winding up my pastime i am going back to the spiritual world and we said no no we also want to be with you so then you have to pay a price advertisement is free when he comes here to the material world he does full fledged advertisement that's free but if you want to experience him more then you have to pay a price and go to the spiritual world so that pay the price is what you know the sadhana is with the whole process of practicing spiritual spirituality it's an effort from our side does it make sense now <laughs> yes bija ji uh the voice is breaking very badly yeah sorry yeah what is uh when krishna is explain in the ultimate form you know as for so how do we then explain the death of krishna which happened just by the like you know he got hit by a by an arrow and he died so how do we then explain that as in so let me answer your question i'll ask you some simple questions okay i am sure you have seen bollywood movies right and you have seen movies where the hero gets shot with two bullets three bullets he doesn't die only six bullets rajinikanth can probably take 10 20 bullets also doesn't die only do you think krishna will die with one arrow when krishna was on the battlefield of kurukshetra driving arjun's chariot how many arrows hit him never died how come with one arrow on his feet he died I mean, you get pricked by thorns all the time, isn't it? If you do get pricked, if you go to the forest for uh, you know for a hike or something like that, you die with one thorn on your feet. How many people have died? One thorn, who's gya kanta, mar gya. Never. Uh, how do you think Krishna is the supreme Lord? Who is? I mean, we are talking about such a superpower. He died with one arrow. 
Bhishma had thousands of arrows all over his body. He still survived for months. And you think Krishna died with one arrow on his feet? Does it even make sense? So the understanding is this. When the Supreme Lord winds up his pastimes, any incarnation of the Lord, whether it is Krishna, Rama, any incarnation of the Lord, if you take, when they wind up their pastime, they wind up in such a way, it leads, leaves a seed of doubt in people's minds. Okay. Why? Because only when you transcend that seed of doubt, can you understand Krishna better. So Krishna purposely does that and goes. He, he drops a seed of doubt in your mind and goes. He says, now deal with this. <laughs> so for a person to understand Krishna completely, you have to learn to see through you know, many of the external things and see through the pastime. And that's why we need help of Acharyas. That's why we need help of teachers who can help us see through uh, a pastime and help us understand this. So when Krishna, what, what, what we see as, you know, him leaving, you know, with a, with a arrow on his feet, that's not at all the uh, spiritual understanding of it. So Krishna left it for those who are uh, having doubts. So those who have doubts, they get confirmation. See, he's a human being. That's exactly what Krishna wants. Okay. Deal with it. And for those who have faith, he helps them overcome their doubt by going through deeper understanding of it, just like what we're discussing right now, you know? So when I'm telling you that he is not even the physical body, how can a spirit soul cannot be killed? Forget Krishna. You and me cannot be killed. The Atma cannot be killed. It cannot be wet by water. It cannot be killed by fire. It cannot be burnt by fire. It cannot be killed by weapons. So when you and me as Atmas, like our physical body can be killed, our spirit soul can never be killed. Krishna is internally, externally, fully spirit only. How can he be killed? Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, 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 <laughs> Guruji, one question. Yes, uh, Yeah, Naresh this, Guruji. Naresh, yes. yes uh, yeah. So, as you mentioned, different uh, scriptures are made basis the audience. Yeah. So when we say Gita or how we evaluate ourselves, what is our capability or what is our Gita. understanding, whether yeah. we are ready to, uh, uh, which scripture is right for us? Yeah. See, now there are different ways of looking at it. One is you can read all the scriptures, you know, and see what your level of uh, intelligence is. The second way is that I prepare myself to the, for the highest, right? I may not be at the highest level right now, but why should I go to a pocket dictionary when I have access to a chambers dictionary? My intelligence may not be capable to understand all the words in the chambers dictionary, but still it has more words in a pocket dictionary. So if I, if I'm just, you know, sticking to a pocket dictionary, I will only understand that much. Am I, am I satisfied with only that much? Or do I aspire for more? If I'm saying I'm satisfied, I'm just okay, I pocket dictionary. Fine, stick to that. But if you want complete knowledge of God, if you want deeper knowledge of God, if you want to grow in your understanding, you may not be there. You may not be ready for everything. But at least I want to aspire for the highest. Then the struggle is there. <laughs> Why do you think it is so difficult? Why do you think it is so difficult to understand Gita? Because it's the chamber's dictionary. It has everything. And only when you when you sit with the chamber's dictionary will your vocabulary improve. How long do you want to sit with basic uh, vocabulary? Isn't it? So I would say that we should always ask. It might take a whole lifetime to get it. But I think it's still a, it's a good aspiration to have. Thank you, Guruji. Hare Krishna Babuji. Yes. Uh, I am Mandar um, yeah. and I have a question, maybe a very juvenile one. Uh, so we have learned about uh, various appearances of Krishna. We also learned that he is the source of everything. Even the demigods have been created from, from Krishna. So my question is, uh, if Krishna is almighty, then why exactly we have a, 
because if krishna can do everything every job of demigod then why demigods are in place why demigods are created you asking yeah see the ceo of a company can do everything right he can do finance also he can do you know uh, uh, marketing also he can do hr also he can do everything why does he hire people so that he can enjoy himself na i suppose that <laughs> <laughs> so, right i suppose that administrative roles just the hands over and he goes to and he goes to have fun sorry <laughs> thank you prabhu ji Anything else? Anybody else has any other questions or discussion? Uh, Shubha ji. Yes, uh, Shubha ji. See, my name is Ramesh. Um, yes. Uh, in this scenario, you know, I'm, it might be a silly one to ask if uh, that is like this. Where does Shiva stand here? You know. Uh, Lord Shiva. Yeah. Yes, Lord Shiva. Yeah. So Lord, Lord Shiva uh, falls in a very special category called Shambhu Tattva. If you remember, I I mentioned that categorically, you know. So. um when i show you the diagram the next time you will actually get the exact position of lord shiva there is a spiritual world yeah. and there is a material world lord yeah. shiva is between the material world and the spiritual world there is a there is a vac there is a space where lord shiva's position is located it's called kailash but yeah. it's it's not in the spiritual world but it is not in the material world it's in between the two that's why that category is a very special category called shambhu tattva so if you can just hang on till the next time you will get a more visual and a more clearer understanding of the exact position of lord shiva you know uh, in uh, our understanding so from a technical point of view lord shiva is for all practical purposes is almost as good as the supreme lord only for all practical purposes except the fact that lord shiva originates from vishnu you know is like the milk origin from the milk comes curd isn't it yeah so now milk and curd are exactly yeah. same concepts yes but the roles are different oh, lord okay. shiva has um, a very specific role in this body in this world oh. okay like uh, uh, like the protector the destroyer, destroyer and the yeah. creator correct uh, yeah okay category yeah. that's one of the roles of lord shiva okay. we'll discuss more about lord shiva the next time because you know when you see the diagrammatic representation you will have such a clarity of each personality where they are fit in what their role is and how much you know in the whole uh, uh, you know the whole uh, scenario of the entire creation who fits in where you know you'll have a better picture better uh, uh, clarity when we do that okay yeah but for now did you did you did you get some uh, clarity of what you yes yes guru ji i have uh, got a, a whole some idea about it yeah Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Guruji, one silly question. Yes. Uh, so on uh, the position of Lord Hanuman. So oh. uh, <laughs> I pray a lot. So it just came in my mind. I I, I also pray a lot. I have written three books on Hanuman. <laughs> so in Hanuman Chalisa, there is one thought: "Or Devata Jitna Dharai Hanumat Sai Isar Sukkarai." so what does it mean so it means that uh, if we pray only hanuman and then uh, entire you know, and that's uh, you know uh, coming back to the four you know why we pray means uh, to get something or <laughs> for fear and then the devotion and the ultimate love so just want to understand what is the position of hanuman ji uh, in this so you it's very simple I, i'll just give you two things you will understand it completely one is who is hanuman ji hanuman is lord shiva himself isn't it rudra you know he is the 11th rudra basically there is no difference between lord shiva and hanuman ji that's the first thing and the second thing is very simple if you want to understand hanuman ji as a personality just see what he does all day the only thing hanuman ji himself does is intensely take shelter of lord ram if you are a hanuman bhakta you have to be a ram bhakta and if you are a ram bhakta you have to be a hanuman bhakta as simple as that see that's what i'm saying trying to tell you there is integration at all levels the christianity now tells you to see differentiation it's you know most religions they tell you to see differentiation and exclusivity if not this then nobody else but the vedic scriptures don't teach you exclusivity they teach you inclusivity 
when i am saying worship krishna doesn't mean we don't worship hanuman ji it doesn't mean that we don't we don't care about lord shiva it's not like that it's an integration but while seeing the integration we also see the categorization the levels at which the all these personalities exist and who is at what role and what is our connection with them you know so when somebody is your father or somebody is your uncle you can't say yaar he is my father he is your uncle baba don't call him father unnecessarily right when somebody is your elder brother don't call him father call him your elder brother you get what i'm saying so why we're looking at this whole sequence to help us understand who these personalities are only when you understand who all these personalities are then you understand the relationship that you have with them isn't it right now we are in a hodgepodge understanding of who's who and our relationship also is hodgepodge only you know so we're saying that we worship hanuman ji but what about ram how can they we worship hanuman without worshiping ram right so we the whole idea of bhagavad gita the whole idea of all our script of vedic scriptures is integration and in a integrated spirit we understand everything so when we look at hanuman ji as rudra so now if you look at this categorization that we spoke about the four tatvas which tatva that hanuman ji falls in shambhu tatva obviously he falls in the shambhu tatva isn't it yes that means he is not a jeeva tatva he is not a normal jeeva definitely and as shambhu what is his role he worshiped vishnu right so hanuman ji himself is teaching us how to worship the supreme lord isn't it you you see you study lord shiva himself lord shiva has spoken this uh, book this uh, scripture called gita mahatma beautiful book you should look at uh, you should google for gita mahatma any of you all google gita mahatma is lord shiva's discussion with parvati devi and both of them are discussing which is the scripture that everybody should read and lord shiva 11 verses in gita mahatma lord shiva is worsh he is recommending bhagavad gita as the book to go to basically the lord shiva himself imagine you know who are you and me we are nothing compared to lord shiva right and lord shiva is heavily recommending that everyone should uh, ekam shastram devaki putra gitam let there be one scripture in the world devaki putra gita you know eko deva devaki putra eva let there be only one god in this world devaki putra the lord shiva is speaking these verses so only when you see the integration na there is no confusion at all when you see it in a separated way na you say are this is my god this is not my god no it's not like that we look at integration and integration is beautiful integration makes everything harmonious it makes everything logical and it there's no emotional pull connected with it we're not talking about division we're not talking about exclusivity we're talking about inclusivity when we say we will be what are the root of the tree it does it means that all the plants all the parts of the tree get nourished that's what it means that means we are nourishing our relationship with lord shiva also we are nourishing our relationship with hanuman ji also we are nourishing our relationship with ganesh also we are nourishing we are nourishing our relationship with lord brahma also we are nourishing our relationship with everybody it's not that we water the root of the tree and everybody else dies all the other uh, leaves and uh, flowers and all die no not like that everyone thrives so the idea of vedic scriptures is integration is inclusivity make sense nareesh ji yeah guruji thank you actually i got confused with the line nari hanuman mai chal sa that ha 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 hey, that that line is an inspirational line but you know you can't uh, look at everything with one line you know so it's a you have to look at it in a more integrated approach okay understood thank you thank you thank you great anyone else any other questions comments okay i know there's a lot to process now many of you all you know may may take next few days to process all that i've said so my humble suggestion to all of you all is during the week please go through the uh, session again we will uh, send you all recordings of the end of the whole session please go through the whole session again throughout the week and process it try to understand it try to absorb as much as you can and the next session when we do this session will get reemphasized in the next session and it, you will you understand it will go much deeper so the next two sessions which will be the you know the concluding sessions of this course will actually assemble, help you assimilate what we have spoken so far in a much more powerful and a much more integral manner okay 
and if anybody in the middle of the week also would like to speak to me have any doubts please feel free to reach out to me i am a part of that whatsapp group and any of you all can uh, please do feel free to reach out okay thank you very much hare krishna and i'll see you all um, next thursday thank you thank you